we are mindful of how we show up, what we talk about, why we don't talk about certain things, because we don't want negativity coming back looking for us. Um, if you want positive outcomes, you got to do positive things. It's really just that simple. Mm, we overcomplicate things. We, we really complicate. Well, we, we try to get by. We, you know, we try to hope that, you know, we go get a pass or, you know, God is and is going to let things slide, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we we can be suspect and then do good and think that the doing good balances out the suspect. Not all of it's coming for you. Um, so it's just a matter of how, you know, we talk about grace. And I think I love grace. I love mercy, too. But on this journey, um, I'm more focused on the good that I do in the world, being intentional about the words that come out of my mouth um, and being even more intentional about the people I'm around. What's happening, y'all? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now, where we're bringing the village to the brothers. Every couple of weeks, you can look forward to a quick inspirational message or a thought-provoking guest with knowledge and wisdom all geared towards helping you be the best father that you can be. We're bringing the village to you. Now is your turn to do something with what you learn. All right, y'all. Let's go. What's going on, y'all? This is Coach Mike D with another episode. Now, dig this. This episode is going to be really, really special because I got a brother who's going to drop some stuff. But the thing is, he's dropping some info. He's dropping some wisdom. He's going to drop gems. But the biggest thing is he's going to share his journey. And that's, to me, where all the gems are really hidden. So the brother that I'm speaking about is none other than my man, Ramal Toon. He's a father. He's an author. He's a global leadership and development executive. He's created some really dope programs from around the world. Um, he's a real estate developer, got some stuff in the works, um, and much more. And so, ladies and fellas and everybody tuning in, Let's welcome my man, Ramal Toon. What's up, brother? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. Man, I appreciate you. And uh, and before we get started, I also got to give a shout out to my man, Sean Dove, because uh, without my man connecting the dots and linking us, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So yeah, yeah. yeah. so we got to give a shout out to brother Sean. Sean is just a natural connector, man. That's just how he gets down. Um, really appreciate that brother. He's actually one of the endorsers of my new book. I wish my dad. Mm, mm, we're definitely going to jump into that man in a little bit. I wish my dad, his new book, definitely good stuff. And what's interesting as before we got started, I was just kind of Googling Ramal tune and I was like, okay, this brother, and it's like 10 years ago, you were speaking and doing different things. I'm like, brother, you've been in the game for a minute, man. Yeah. I've been, I've been around for a little while. Uh, I feel it sometimes, uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Check this out, man. We, we're supposed to feel it. If we're not feeling it, that means we ain't using it. You dig? So I dig. yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. No doubt. So before we jump into your journey, man, I like the brothers to give shout outs because truthfully, who are we without the wind beneath our wings? Right. And we need to really give the shout out of those who are most important. I interviewed a brother who is uh, he's a motorcycle stunt rider. He's been in all these different movies or whatever. And he was mentioning to me, he said, all the important people in a movie get listed up front. And I was just like, yo, that is extremely important. I will never forget that in any interview that I do. So before we get into your journey, brother, give some shout outs. Man, I'm just going to give a few because you start naming names. People get mad when they <laughs> names get mentioned. So uh, I'll, I'll do the easy ones. My kids, Amon and Jordan. Uh, and then I got, you know, I got a group of friends, uh, my friend Najee Dorsey, the owner of Black Art in America, Rudy Rasmus, Joe Daniels, Vance Ross, Paul Hosh, and uh, Rob Lee. Those are my, what I call my fave five, those brothers. And uh, Najee is just uh, one of the best friends I have over at Black Art in America. So got to shout him out. We'll actually be hosting uh, the book launch event over at Black Art in America here in Atlanta. So uh, yeah, those are my people. I won't go dropping any more names beyond that because people start getting mad when they get left out. But everybody knows that those are the people that, you know, uh, big time role in my life. Also, Hadari Williams. Mm, mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of times it's in the church, they say, blame it on my head and not my heart. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But these are the people I, who play an integral, integral part in, in my day to day. Uh, there's more, you know, LB, Lawrence Brown, Preston Perry, Nico, Shumpert, you know, those are the homies, real tight. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and it's interesting as you're mentioning those and giving shout out to those, it's kind of like somebody posted something recently and they were saying how when people pour into you, you need to pour into people who also pour back into you. And I challenge that a little bit because yes, we have people that are in our circle that we pour into and it's like we're going back and forth supporting each other in our endeavors. But outside of that really tight knit, the vast majority, vast majority of the individuals that you pour into typically aren't the people that pour back into you themselves. It's somebody else is pouring into you. It's kind of like somebody pours their cup into you and then your cup goes into somebody else. And then somebody pours back into you and your cup goes to somebody else. It's not just going back and forth between each other. So it's like, even if we forget to shout out or we don't mention the names of individuals, it's not that they're not important because they make a you know, make a huge impact in our lives. But yeah. it's not always about us going back and forth with each other. Sometimes it's like them coming to me and I'm giving somebody else. And they did the same thing to me. Well, I would say most of the people in my life, just about all of them, that especially everybody I mentioned, and I'm sure that I know there are some I miss, Kendra Frazier and others, that um, it's always a mutual exchange. And it's mm -hmm. never just about business. Like we mm -hmm. have friendships, real relationships that aren't just about, you know, um, an exchange of services, like mm. we ride together on life. Um, mm. And we, at times we do business things together, but life and uh, really being a part of the person's journey uh, is first and foremost. Ooh, your life supersedes the business. That oh yeah, without that, there's no good business. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, without I mean, again, we haven't gotten into your journey yet, but without that, there's no good business. Could you expound on that a little bit? Because to me, there are so many of us that, and you've probably heard this numerous times. Oh, it's just business. Mm, no, fam, it's not just business. It's actually life and business is a component of that. But expound a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, you know, I got I have people with whom I do strict strictly business. Like mm -hmm. they're we're not friends, we're colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to know which box uh people live in, in in your life. Um the people I named are people who, you know, like I said, with whom we'll do business, but first and foremost, we're friends. Um, the way I grew up, you know, um, there was a code to relationships and friendship came first, you know, loyalty, trust, honesty, communication. Uh, you know, people have disagreements, but you you squash it. You know, we don't gossip. Me and my friends, I, I don't I don't have anyone that I consider a friend that actually gossips. I don't I don't really deal with people like that. Um, you know, it's got to be good energy, good values. And we got to share some common beliefs uh, about how we see the world, the impact we want to have in it. Um, but most importantly, like, you know, a friendship uh, has some expectations and mm -hmm. You know, we we communicate those, but then we also uh, learn by example, um, you know, learn as we go through life, I should say. But uh, yeah, so I think that I am able to do the work that I do because of the people in my life. You know, when you're down, uh, you got to have people who can put the battery in your back, who are going to pray for you, who are going to encourage you, and who may even pick up the work while you're down. Ooh. Because sometimes being down isn't bad. It's time to recharge, gain some wisdom, um, confront yourself and deal with whatever it is. Um, but having people who really ride with you, um, who are not able to just show up in word, but in deed, um, that's how we move. And we do that for each other. You know, some people say, oh, yes, you know, um, paying it forward. It's like, no, that's just how we get out. Like, Ooh. I do things for my friends because they're my friends full stop you know mm. there's no agenda of i'm gonna get it back we just it just flows naturally you don't even have to think i'm gonna get it back it's it's coming for you so Ooh. Uh, that's just the nature of our relationships man hold on you said you don't have to go get it back it's coming for you like that thing right there but then you also said it's not paying it forward it's just how we get down Again, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just the that's just the nature of the connection. But I truly believe anyway that um, anything, any good you put back, put out in the world is coming back for you. But the same thing goes for negativity. Any negativities you put out there is, is coming looking for you, too. Um, so, you know, we are mindful of how we show up, what we talk about why we don't talk about certain things because we don't want negativity coming back looking for us. Um, if you want positive outcomes, you got to do positive things. It's really just that simple. Mm, we overcomplicate things. 
we, we really complicate but well, we we try to get by we you know we try to hope that you know we go get a pass or you know god is and it's gonna let things slide you know mm -hmm. that we we can be suspect and then do good and think that the doing good balances out the suspect now all of it's coming for you um so it's just a matter of how you know we talk about grace and i think i love grace i love mercy too but on this journey um i'm more focused on the good that i do in the world being intentional about the words that come out of my mouth um and being even more intentional about the people i'm around Hmm. Man, it's interesting. So one of the things that I do, my family and I, we, we act a little bit. So like if you watch any of these crime drama shows on TV one, you know, you may see my face on ATL Homicide, Sins of the City, Fatal Attraction, whatever. And it's interesting. A lot of them involve, um, you know, suspects. Right. And you mentioned about being suspect. And I'm it, it, my mind immediately went to the whole notion of if you are a suspect, you should not be surprised when you get interrogated. Yeah, there it is. If you're suspect, don't be surprised when you get interrogated. And so it's like, so even if, now it might not happen immediately. So you may think you get away with something, but if you suspect, and that can be acting suspect, or you can actually be a suspect, don't be surprised when you're interrogated at some point. Hmm. Brother, you drop. See, and it's funny. I hope y'all are paying attention because my man Ramar has been dropping gems all up in this. And you probably need to rewind this thing about five minutes to hear what he said, hear that sequence of conversation, because brothers drop some gems that you need to pay attention to. But I think those gems are rooted in the journey that he's lived. So if you don't mind, man, take us back, man, take us back to where all this stuff began, where the mindset, the mind frame came from, you know, based off of your lived experience, brother. Yeah, I think the mindset has come one from being in therapy for over a decade now, uh, dealing with my journey and unpacking it to find the real me, you know, this idea of who are you without your trauma? Who mm -hmm. are you without your pain? Uh, something that I've been living into uh, to find my true authentic self, to live into that more deeply and intentionally. <clears throat> but, you know, I grew up inner city kid in the Bay Area, lived all over the Bay, San Francisco, Oakland, Vallejo, different schools from elementary through 11th grade, you know, went to live with my dad as a teenager, served in the military, uh, then went to Howard, got my Howard uh, hoodie on now, always represent when I'm doing interviews, um, <laughs> and then went to Duke uh, for grad school. Um, yeah, but, you know, found that I was living a very different life from what I grew up in. Uh, but in many ways, um, my mindset, my anxieties, my fears, my doubts, and even my self-esteem were still tied to an old story of my childhood. Mm. Um, so my environment looked different. I was living different. Uh, but in many ways, my mindset was still the same. And so by going to therapy, you know, I've just been able to unpack my journey learn from it, and then give that back to the world. Um, one of my friends has a saying, if you can pass down trauma, then you can also pass down medicine. Ooh. And so one of the things that I look to do uh, is take the medicine that I've received and then give it back to the world uh, so that other people can heal their stories too and, and learn to thrive, not just attain more, uh, but to be better, um, be better people and to uh, realize that it's more about impacting lives uh, while you also, you know, live the life that you want, make sure you're creating opportunities for other people to do the same. Mm, creating opportunities for others to do the same. You know, it's interesting. Um, the dog pound back in the day had a verse and had a line that said, it ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. Right now, contextually, we know they were probably talking about something else. They were definitely but, talking about oh. something. <laughs> you from the West Coast, you know exactly what's up. But the thing that's interesting is, you know, like you mentioned, if you can pass down trauma, you can also pass down medicine. You know, if it ain't no fun, if the homies can't have none, we can be talking about something negative and destructive, but we could also be talking about opportunity. We could also be talking about environment, like you just mentioned. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. I think that um, one of the things I know that I've had to grapple with is survivor's guilt. You know, a mm. lot of my homies from back in the day, um, their lives didn't change as much as mine. You know, we made some different choices, 
Um, but I think sometimes the choices are made based on the information you have. Mm. And then there's the courage to make the shift. But sometimes people don't have the information. Um, and so I really work hard to give that information back, to put people up on game on how to change their lives, um, to do that work. Uh, so, yeah, you know, survivor's guilt sometimes has me feeling like uh, I sometimes I felt alone because mm -hmm. People that I engage now, you know, in these different places that I'm able, I have the opportunity to be, um, don't come from where I come from. Mm. And so they don't um, see the world the way I see it. Um, they don't understand that I'm showing up with a different story um, that I have to sometimes feel like I got to put away because they don't get it mm. and it can feel isolating. Uh, so that caused me to think about my friends who, you know, I wish could share the journey or, I, you know, that have some, many have chosen not to, and some didn't make it. Um, so in my work, in many ways, I, I do what I do to reach, you know, people who uh, need to be put up on game, need the information, need opportunities. So I don't just talk, you know, I invest in people just as much as I invest in projects. Um, I think any project that doesn't change the lives of people, I question its value. Um, cause I believe that the greatest asset we have in society is, is people, you know, you know, it's interesting as you, you were talking, you were saying how individuals, you know, the survivor's guilt, meaning that, you know, you made it or you're making it and maybe others didn't. And some of that was due to choices. Some of that was due to, you know, options, available information, even inspiration or the courage to just make a choice. And, you know, as you were talking, I was, you know, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg type philosophy of, you know, is it the information that leads you to then say, okay, now I'll have the courage to make a different choice? Or is it the person who just said, you know, it's like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm going to have the courage. And then, you know, the information kind of presents itself. And I think each individual person circumstance is obviously different but that's the beauty of having the option of both right you want people to kind of build their courage to get sick and tired of being sick and tired but then you also at the same time want to present the information and the options because a lot of people are as only good as the choices available to them right yeah i don't i don't think it's one or the other i think that we we live in some for those of us who come from certain worlds we live mm -hmm. in the tension of both yes um, you, you know, you can get tired of being tired and, and get up. Some people are so tired, they can't get themselves Ooh, and they deep. need somebody to come get them um, and put the battery in their back, help them, you know, heal their wounds so that they have the capacity. Mm. Um, you know, this idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is just actually not realistic and not afforded to everyone. That's right. Um, you know, everybody doesn't even have boots. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to look at what what do I have to do? And am I willing to do it to help somebody else um, have the skill sets and have the um, the capacity uh, to take the next steps? And then there are times, yeah, when you get the information, uh, it's what you do with it. So I think it's both. And I think it's even more complicated than that. That's Those are the obvious things that we see, um, but we don't know the challenges of people that we engage mm -hmm. until we engage them. Um, I like to sit down with people and get to know their story rather than assume, assume that I know what they need. Mm, man, I'm going to tell you, it, it's so interesting. And I'm so glad that you went there. Um, the power of engagement, because you don't know what someone needs until you actually sit there with them. And even then, you know, you have to build a level of trust and relationship for them to actually get to it. Because so, for instance, if you ask somebody what they need, first thing that comes out of my, out of, off the top of their mind yeah, that may be something that they're needing, but the reality is that's typically not that thing, right? But you have to build that level of trust to get to a point in which they will open up and say, I know I said this, but let me tell you where I really need help, right? Yeah. Or this is where I really need, you know, this insight, but that cannot get here until we openly engage, until we have intimate connections with individuals and break these barriers down, build these bridges and, um, and create an opportunity and a platform you know, and create, you know, infrastructure for that to happen in a safe space. So yeah, brother, I'm you know, glad relationships don't require platforms and infrastructure. They just require taking the time to go sit down with people. Ooh, thank it's you. It's really not that complicated. Like, 
we don't need a you know mission statement and vision statement mm. and strategy to go sit down and ask somebody how they're doing mm. um, i think you know when you talk to it from talk about it from an institutional organizational perspective yeah but even then you still got to sit down and get to know people um and listen um i think that one of the things i learned in writing i wish my dad was um the power of listening to people and asking questions, um, mm. you know, probing questions that weren't uh, looking for a specific answer, but really being curious about uh, these guys and their stories. Mm. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you pushed back there because that was such a needed moment. We don't need infrastructure. We just got to spend time. We got to be willing to spend time. We have to be willing to engage. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was on a platform probably about four or five months ago. And the guy asked me, he said, Mike, so what is your definition of manhood? And I thought about it and I said, my definition of manhood, and I really expanded this to encompass all adults, not just men, but some men and women. But to me, the definition of actually being an adult is someone who's willing and able to do what's necessary in the moment. Mm. Like, it was just simple to me. Like, I was just like, one who is an adult is one who's willing and able to do what's necessary in the moment. And to your point, back to the notion of spending time with people, we have to be willing to do so. And I think for so many of us, from an immature mental perspective, we get to a point in which we're not willing to spend time with people, or maybe because of our own trauma and situations at that moment, maybe we're not able to do so, right? Based off of our own challenges. But the reality is we have to be willing and able to do what's necessary in the moment, whatever that is. And to yeah. me, that's what adults, what adulting is. That's what adulting is. I think that's, again, one layer of adulting, mm -hmm. right? There are I many love it. There's to it. You know, you mentioned like we don't need infrastructure for relationships. I think we need boundaries and clear communications of expectations. But in terms of organizations and the work of change, right? And when we're talking at a much bigger community yes. level, yeah, you need capacity, infrastructure, you know, you need metrics and quantifiable outcomes and all of that. But relationships have those same things, you know, mm. they, there should be some evidence that this relationship has value um, and impact on, on another person's life and on my life. You know, it's interesting you bring up manhood, um, you know, and talking to brothers over the last year about their dads, I found that um, we've had some some real issues with how it's defined and who sets the parameters and definition for who we get to be as men. Um, and in many instances, I learned that those ideas of manhood uh, didn't serve uh, the men in our lives well, and nor have they served us well. Yet we've been handed down an idea of identity as a man that um, actually in some ways hasn't been helpful. Um, and in some instances lacked vision. Mm. Um, so I think that uh, when we talk about manhood, uh, we need to put it in the context of vision. Um, and we need to tie it to, um, you know, emotional health, mm. uh, any idea of manhood that doesn't include emotional health uh, is probably not going to be good for us or the people we care about. Ooh, dude, I'm gonna tell you, it's interesting. So over the last few years, there has been a huge emphasis on mental health, right? Like, um, you know, you see, you know, black men going to therapy being a little bit more prominent, you know, in as far as like the the mainstream, you know, prominence as far as media is concerned. And there's a lot of focus on mental health, which is important, but you hit on something that I believe is a more pervasive problem. And that's an issue with emotional health. We don't know how to handle our emotions. And I, and I use a terminology or I use a little example, and it's that emotions are important. Emotions should be in the car with you. They can ride shotgun, but you should never toss the keys to the emotions. Because when the emotions are driving the car, that's when we got some challenges, especially if you don't know how to properly handle or manage them. Yeah. My therapist has a saying, he says, your feelings serve your thoughts and your thoughts serve you. Ooh. So if you change your thoughts, you could change your feelings, right? And I think that that's what therapy does. Therapy gets you to look at the, th the stories that have shaped how you think, Ooh. what you believe, and that then have an impact on how you feel about yourself and who you believe you can become in the world. So the two are, you know, they're, they're brother and sister, if you will, or mm -hmm. they're, they're twins, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mental health uh, for me 
uh, has led to emotional health and continues mm -hmm. to. I think that um, it's an ongoing journey of becoming a better person um, and constantly engaging uh, the stories that um, I sometimes tell myself that aren't good for me, um, reshaping those beliefs, reshaping those stories in order to feel more empowered and liberated um, to then go out and just be a better human in the world and, and, and have a real impact, um, you know, on the people, on the communities that I care about. Mm. Dude, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, like just hearing you articulate it is so powerful and it's the marriage between the two. It's not, and it goes back to like we were talking earlier, it's not either or, you know, it's not this or that, it's more layered than that. It's more complex than that, not complicated, but more complex than that. And, uh, but we need both. And then one feeds the other, depending on the circumstances, the situation that's going on. So extremely important. And, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, some of this growth and development over the last year has taken place with the interviews that you've done for I Wish My Dad. Talk to us a little bit about the project and what led to it. And you know, I guess some of the takeaways um, of, the, of the book itself. Yeah, you know, uh, I wish my dad, the subtitle is The Power of Vulnerable Conversations Between Fathers and Sons. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I tell the stories of 17 men that I had conversations with about their fathers as it relates to love, affection, and time. Um, so each chapter title is actually based on that guy's story and something uh, that came out of it from I wish my dad didn't silence my voice. I wish my dad was faithful to our home. I wish my dad took uh, responsibility for his mistakes. I wish my dad loved my mom more. I wish my dad loved himself more. Uh, I wish my dad put uh, like what, relationships before finances. Mm. Uh, are all title chapter titles in this book, and you hear these stories uh, from these men and a variety of stories in them. And the way I got to the book was um, reconnecting with my own father and dealing with our story. And after um, going to see him, I was home reflecting on, I wish my dad moments, you know, mm. I would bike riding together because he loved to ride bikes. I wish we played sports together. I went to games together and just all kinds of things where in essence, I was wishing for his time and being Ooh to uh, have moments where I was closer to him, where we did things together that we enjoyed. And in that moment of reflection, it just hit me that um, I, I believe that there are uh, people all over the world with these, I wish my dad moments. And I, I wanted to not only hear their stories, but I wanted to tell those stories um, so that one, readers would know that they're not alone and having these, I wish my dad moments that we've, Many of us have had these challenging relationships or wanted healthier relationships. Um, I wanted people to know that healing was possible. And by hearing these stories, um, you would see takeaways from therapists. Uh, you would hear from the guys in terms of how they've been healing their own journey, how they show up differently for their children. Um, so it's not just, oh, my dad made these mistakes. It's in many of the instances, there were good relationships too. Um, amongst those that are clearly challenging in the book, but even in the good ones, there were lessons learned around that would have made them better. Mm. Um, and there were stories that had long-term impact um, that from the relationships with their father. So uh, it's also not just a book for men, for fathers and sons. I've had uh, moms read the book, single parent mom recently said, I bought this book for my son. Uh, with the hope that it would help him in the ways that I feel I can't. And she said, I started reading it and I realized that it was helping me heal too. Uh, and I think that that's the case for a lot of women who read the book. Uh, they will find uh, their the man in their lives, their, their son's dad through these stories and get a lens into um, who he is, uh, mm -hmm on another level, who he is from an emotional perspective and where the strengths and weaknesses came from and where he needed or needs help um, just as a feeling person who uh, only parented through, through the skills and lens of what he knew mm. uh, and what he's learned along the way. Um, some of us, you know, we've parented through our wounds 
um, rather rather than through our healing. And this book kind of tells all those stories. Brother, as you were talking, man, um, again, my brain thinks of connections and, and all of that. And, and I don't know what's next from the standpoint of like the next part of the series, but you have the title, I Wish My Dad. It would be interesting to have the children of the ones that you interviewed with a book or a project, I'm glad my dad. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like how the continuum of I wish my dad from the dads and then the next series of the children of those dads, their title or their chapters are I'm glad my dad. And so it's kind of like showing this continuum and growth of maybe I had challenges here but I made those adjustments. And so now my kid doesn't say, I wish my dad, my kid says, I'm glad my dad. Yeah, and you know, um, that's actually in the book, what you see uh, from the men who became fathers, many of them did. Uh, you hear them talk about that pivot, what they're doing differently. They even talk about how they, through their own perspective, think their children see them. One comes to mind is Hadari. Uh, I just love watching how he loves his boys. And when you look at his story, um you you get a sense and you get a lens into why he loves and loves them the way he does and why he shows up the way he shows up and he talks about them um after he talks about his relationship with his father i think you know the concept i'm glad my dad comes through this i think that they'll we'll have even more of those stories when brothers who have challenges heal theirs um, we create opportunity for more children to have those uh, those stories. Um, and these brothers had them too. Um, mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. It's just, this isn't a book that's solely about uh, the challenges. Mm -hmm. You see many stories where they had amazing fathers. They just still had, I wish my dad moments mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't make it this utopia of perfect relationships. That just would be dishonest. Mm -hmm. um, our relationships have challenges. Um, and so what we're looking at is even in those that are healthy, there's always something to learn to be a better person and even be a better parent. Um, that we oftentimes need to hear from the child um, and what they're experiencing rather than what us as parents trying to justify what we're giving. Mm. Man, what they're experiencing versus us trying to justify what we're giving. Like, I think as a parent, that is a very challenging concept because, you know, Ultimately, we do need to listen. We need to, you know, be aware of what's going on, but we have to also suppress our ego to an extent so that we don't have to get to the mindset of, let me tell you why I'm doing this. Let me tell you why I'm giving you this. Let me tell you why this is happening the way that it's happening. We're trying to, I, I've, I don't think I've ever heard it articulated like that before, you know, ex them or taking their expressed feeling versus us focusing on justifying what we're giving. And if we as parents can do a better job of not always immediately going to the, let's justify what I'm giving, but really get an understanding of their expressed feelings about this, we might not need to justify it to begin with. Yeah. And I, you know, as a parent, you know, I have adult children, my daughter's mm -hmm. 23, my son's 21. You know, I made my share of mistakes and our story, my son and I is in the book. He interviewed me about my dad and I interviewed my son about me. Mm -hmm. And uh, those full interviews are at the end of the book, um, uncut so that people can learn from uh, my mistakes and hear the impact of mistakes through the lens of a child and how they experienced them and the impact it had on them. You know, when it comes to parenting, sometimes we've been told, um, you know, we tell the kid what to do and they mm. listen to us mm. and um, we have all the authority and power and they don't have a voice. And so when we, when we operate from that, that lens, um, we are silencing our child. And yet, and when they become adults, we want them to be confident, you mm -hmm. know, speak up and represent themselves well. Mm -hmm. But we constantly telling them that they don't have a voice at home or showing them that they don't. That's the first place they learn that they have some autonomy, that they are worthy of being heard, that they are learning to be a communicator of their journey, their feelings, and, and their expectations. So if we aren't doing that with our children, then how can we expect them to 
to do it when they go out into the world if we're not modeling it through how we have build relationship with them and you're right it it takes some humility um you have to humble yourself you know to realize that yeah you know what i saw in this book for example so many times uh the parent was busy working making money um and didn't have time uh to be in relationship on uh, you know when a child always needed it and typically it was i work to provide i work so that you can have this life you know, i'm busy because you know fill in the blank but in every single story um what you'll find is that the kid wanted the time more than the stuff mm -hmm. um, and that the absence of time actually had more impact Ooh. than anything that you gave them because they felt like they didn't know their parent. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to dads, they were like, I wanted to know, you know, what made him sad? What, was he ever afraid? How did he deal with fear? How did he deal with sadness? Because now I have these moments where I have fears and I have doubts and I have had to figure it out on my own because no one shared with me, the adults didn't share with me um, how they handled, you know, their feelings, how they handled anger and fear and doubt and how they pull themselves out in healthy ways. And so these, you know, these brothers in the book share those, you know, how that would have been uh, valuable to them to just know their dad's story, their journey. Um, one guy in the book, uh, Rudy's chapter, he says, I hung out with my dad. I always went with him wherever he went um, because I got to experience a man that everyone knew and loved that was fun. And, mm. you know, and that's not who he was at home. Mm. You know, he was a different wow. man at home, but in, out in public with his friends, he was a great guy. He was fun loving, you know, everybody liked being around him. And I got to experience him in that way. And so that's why I hung out with him because I got to see a guy that I didn't get to see at home. Ooh, man, <laughs> when you were talking, it makes me think about like a, um, like a celebrity or a public figure, right? You know, the world loves this celebrity. They love their work. They love what they put out. They love whatever. But then at home, that celebrity, what we see publicly is a character. But then at home is the real person. And so it's kind of like this whole notion of, your kids are 100% aware of that duality. Like they yeah. know <laughs> they know what's going on and they know that, look, what the world is seeing, oh, they're loving you, wanting your autograph and paying to spend time with you. Hmm, I, I want to see that. Both, yeah, I think they both can be true. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, yes, yeah, sometimes it's a character, people are, you know, playing a role, but oftentimes that's also just a part of the, who they are too. Mm -hmm. um, it's another aspect aspect of their identity. Mm. Um, just they're showing up differently in different places. And rather than compartment, compartmentalizing, bring all of you uh, to the relationships um, that you're in. And so, uh, yeah, I found that, and that, and again, in Rudy's story, uh, the guy, his dad was, you know, in the streets, he could have brought aspects of that personality home. Mm. Uh, you know, that jovial, that fun loving person home. Uh, but he obviously had a lens and a story about what home required of him. Mm. Uh, that was different from what he believed what the world required of him. Uh, I, there was that, um, that interview between uh, uh, James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni. Mm -hmm. uh, where you know oh yes i remember yeah, yeah. where she's like come home lie to me too you know you give go me the same stuff you give them yeah the same stuff you give them make me feel worthy and feel good about myself too um rather than just giving it away to everyone else and i think that um for some of us our kids are like you know bring that energy home that loving exciting you uh that you share with everyone else um so you know those are the kind of stories that you know people would find and i wish my dad um it's, it's a really insightful book with there are definitely some hard stories, but they end well. You know, uh, there's good news in every one of them, the lessons mm -hmm. learned and how people have pivoted. Uh, but I think that uh, people will be really blessed by this book um, and it'll make them better people and better parents. Ooh, my man. Look, I got to get me a cock. I get me a signed copy, you know, so we're going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I got you, man. Okay, okay, appreciate it. Appreciate it. You know, and, I, 
fact, Good. just one last thing on that. It was interesting when I interviewed the guys, I would always start out with, so tell me what kind of man was your dad, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they would give this story around the man he was, the, how he was perceived by the world, how his colleagues at work perceived him. And they would go on and on. And then I'd pivot and say, so now tell me what kind of father was he? Ooh. And the stories were different. Um, mm -hmm. There were uh, nuances to who he was as a man in the world uh, that were not in who he was as a father. Um, in some ways, they collided in, in very healthy ways, and in others, they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was this great guy outside, and then there was just this disciplinarian that I was afraid of at home. Mm -hmm. um, or there was, he was amazing to my friends and I, but he had so much doubt about himself. Mm -hmm. you know, I wish he loved himself more and could see the amazing impact he's had on people. Mm -hmm. Man, dude, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Fellas, ladies, everybody listening, make sure to go get a copy of I Wish My Dad by Ramal Toon. Like, if this little bit didn't inspire you to go grab this book, I don't think you can be inspired by any interview that you'll ever hear. So that's one. But then two, it's interesting how as you're talking, it makes me think back to earlier in our conversation on the power of engagement, how you mentioned that we don't know what people need until we spend time with them, Right. And you also mentioned earlier about how, you know, when we were talking about the definition of manhood, how society has placed these, you know, limited definitions or whatever on what a man's supposed to be. And if we garner our definition of manhood from what society has generationally put down on us to this is what you do and this is how you do it, then we think that, okay, this is how I'm supposed to show up at home. But then also, this is how I show up in, in the workplace or in public. But then back to your point, for some of the kids, they want some of what you show publicly to come home, right? But we don't know that until we engage with them. And it goes back to, like you mentioned earlier, too, about how, you know, society says we're supposed to tell them what to do. But we learn so much from our kids. And I think in our conversation, if you didn't get anything from this, is the power of engagement, of asking questions, of understanding what do your kids need? What does your wife need? What does, you know, the people that the people that are responsible for what you're doing and how you show up, what do they need from you? And my whole thing is it goes back to my definition of manhood and, you know, a person or an individual who's willing and able to do what's necessary in the moment, provide it give it. If they need that from you, they need some less disciplinarian and a little bit more fun, just so they know that it's okay to have fun, you know, at home, man, bring that. Yeah. And sometimes it's just simple things. Like every guy in this book, wish they heard their dad say, I love you mm. more often mm. for some, just, they never heard it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one guy in the book, it, he and his dad shook hands. They never hugged. Mm. Uh, they were business partners, mm -hmm. um, you know, but simple things that don't cost a parent anything. Mm -hmm. um, just saying, I love you um, often. No, you can't say I love you enough, right? You can't overdo it on saying I love you. People mm -hmm. want to hear it. Um, they just want it to be hugged when not just because something happened or they were sad, but just to feel affection and compassionate touch uh, to be feel feel love uh, from their parent. They want it to be hugged. They want it to hear, I love you. And they want it time, not just time in ways that made their parent comfortable, but in times, um, time in ways where the parent was willing to enter into the child's world. Ooh. And I realized that sometimes as parents, we are willing to engage our children in ways that are comfortable for us. And the mm. thing is that enter their world in ways that are comfortable for them that may cause us some discomfort, mm -hmm. but we are willing to do it because it shows the child, I'm willing to come into your world and do what you want um, so that you, you feel valued and the things that you care about uh, you see that I care about them too. Mm, man, if you won't come into the neighborhood to hang out with me at the crib, then I don't know how close we are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's like, as, I, as, as you were talking about parents and kids, 
it's just like that one hit home because we want them to come and sit in church and sit down and be quiet. We want them to come and go to the performance and sit there and watch this thing. We want them to go here, the places that we're comfortable, and for them to sit, you know, be good little folks and do what they're supposed to do. But then they flip and say, hey, dad, come outside. Let me show you how I do these backflips and uh, hang out with my friends and this and that. You're like, hold up, man. Listen, uh, <laughs> I'm so it's, it's like it's interesting. You know, we have to open ourselves up. And I love that, dude. If y'all listen, I hope y'all caught that gym. Literally, don't always invite the kids into the world that you're comfortable in. Insert yourself in the places that they're comfortable. Watch some of them crazy YouTube videos and the TikTok dance stuff that really, you know, what they're all into. It's just like, yeah, I'm like, that's not my thing. But if that's your world and I want to build with you, I might enter that world to kind of, you know, show you that I'm cool with you being yourself. We do that with our friendships, right? If yeah. It's always wanting us to do what they want to do the way they want to do it because it's fun for them and they gain value from it mm -hmm. they never come into our world to show that they care about what we care about you're going to question that friendship right mm. because now it feels one-sided the experience is one-sided um it doesn't mean that they don't care about us it just means that they care in ways that are comfortable and convenient for them mm. i think that um with our kids it's showing them that we are willing to enter into their world to learn um learn them learn what they care about learn how they experience it and and i've seen you know people you know i've heard people tell me the stories of how much it mattered when their parent came out and did something that they know the parent doesn't like doing but they mm -hmm. know they did it because the kid likes it and it just it was even more fun mm -hmm. um for the child because they could see the sacrifice, you know, mm. uh, you know, from playing games together where they know their dad does not like the playing games, but he sat there, he played, he didn't complain. And it was like, wow, that my dad really leaned into this experience with me. Um, and I feel valued and seen. Mm -hmm. They have to see the sacrifice. And that's, it's so interesting, see the sacrifice and sacrifice doesn't have to be painful, right? It's just you making an effort to show them that, hey, I care and I want to see what you got going on. I was talking like, about time. Yeah, it's just time. Like, and it's, it's funny, as you were saying, because the other day, you know, like my kids were in here watching a movie and I think my wife sat there and watched it. I think I might've gone to the back to watch a football game or something. And the previous movie, you know, I sat down and watched, but this last one, I was like, I ain't watching this. But to your point, it's like, now it's kind of like one of those, ah, I should have just sat down and watched this old crazy movie just because, I mean, again, I watched it's other because, movies. Because it's not about you, right? It ain't it's, about me. <laughs> it's, it's about what they want to watch. And mm. they know you don't like, but they they can really appreciate the fact that you sat there and watched it with them and enjoyed it through their lens, not your own, right? Ooh. Um, Ooh. Appreciate what they appreciate. Ask them, why do you like this? What What's, you know, learn them and learn what makes them come alive, what makes them laugh and what they enjoy and why they enjoy it. Um, and again, it's the sacrifice of time and, and putting ourselves aside. And these are things that I've learned, you know, in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. I, I definitely was not good at it at all, as you will see in the conversation in the book um, with, between my son and I. It's, but it was interesting when he interviewed me about my dad. He was like, wow, no wonder you didn't get it, right? He, he, I lived into what I learned. Mm. Um, not only from not having my dad around, which I in turn then wasn't fully present for my son, but then I also, it was a thing that I learned and inherited from my uncles around survival that I was passing down to my son that were skills he did not need, right? Mm. You know, um, what I realize now is that my uncles were teaching me the skills that they needed to survive in our neighborhood. And so in essence, their assumption was, if this is going to be the limits of your existence in this neighborhood like us, then these are the skills you're going to need. So, but if there was a vision for who I could become beyond the boundaries of my neighborhood where I could thrive and be highly educated and have a career that changed my location and my way of life, if they had the knowledge, they would have taught me those things. They would have had a vision for who I could become that was bigger than survival. And so 
I realized that, yeah, they were teaching me survival skills, not thriving skills. Mm. And, but they weren't equipped with thriving skills because circumstance and environment didn't allow for them to thrive. It was all about, I got to make it. So mm. here's what we're going to teach you about how to make it rather than here's what we're going to teach you about how to become a better person and how to thrive in life. Man, you just dropped something that was so powerful regarding people teach you what they know. And sometimes what, the limits of what they think you're going to experience in life. Yeah, yeah. I, well, did you, but see, but that also kind of encompasses vision to an extent. And if they don't Absolutely. have vision or they can't, because I mean, we can't predict the future, but if they don't understand or have the, the, the capacity to see how things evolve or understand in technology Moore's law, where like computing capacity doubles every, what, 18 months or two years or something like that, where things continue to evolve and grow. And if you look at history, how things happen, we can't necessarily predict what will be here five years from now because right. of the rapid speed of growth and development. And so for some, it's not about being able to predict what's coming. It's about creating the capacity to deal with whatever comes. So right. it's like strengthening your, you know, your resolve and problem solving and critical thinking skills so that no matter what comes, you're able, you know, to handle it because I can't predict. I mean, you think about social media 15 years ago, none of these platforms, this platform we're talking on right now, wasn't around 10 years ago. You know what I'm saying? If we stop and think about it, who could have conceptualized some of these things? Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting as you were saying that, I mean, and I think that's why it's important for us to gain as many experiences, not all experiences, but gain a lot of experiences so that we prepare ourselves, but then also to keep ourselves open to not necessarily training people for what we think is going to be there, but building their capacity to learn, grow, and adapt to what may be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that, you know, one of the things I've had to learn is that um, it's hard for, for some parents uh, to have a vision beyond uh, who they want their child to become, Woo! right? Like um, what good. they want them to do, career, mm -hmm. you know, professionalism, education, but those things don't make the person. Mm -mm. Right. And so the, with, in my circumstance, uh, it was toughness, be strong, don't cry, you know, be a man, you know, it was about fighting skills. Mm -hmm. It was about prowess in the community. Mm -hmm. It was about, you know, misogynistic tendencies, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. womanizing, mm -hmm. and which was some distorted sense of what made you a man was, you know, how many women you engaged. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were some very toxic things about it. And when I look at how did these things they were teaching me work out for them? Ooh, mm. not very good at all. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So why did I accept these things as true for my own life? Now, as a kid and as a teenager, I didn't have that lens um, to ask those questions and to look at the impact. Um, as an adult, um, I've had to unpack those things and realize that some of my ideas of manhood that I received from the adults in my life didn't serve them well. They haven't been serving me well, so I don't have to keep them, mm -hmm. right? And so this idea of being handed what, and they had great expectations. They wanted me to be a professional athlete. You know, mm -hmm. I was going to be the one who got us out the hood. Mm -hmm. That didn't require being a better person. No. Um, that's just the activity of life. That was money and stuff, right? That mm -hmm. didn't mean I was going to be a good human. Um, in many ways, I think some of the things that they were, that I would now consider, you know, healthy, you know, thriving, and emotionally and mentally healthy, that kind of language they would have defined as weak. Absolutely. Because those, they would, you know, the thinking would have been like, what you going to do with, with that out here when you got to fight, you know, mm -hmm. I mean? mm -hmm. um, or when you have to, you know, back somebody up with a look or mm -hmm you know, how you have to carry yourself around here. Like being, talking about your feelings is soft. Well, mm. when you look at if that is true and being tough is the idea, let me look at how that's played out for your life, right? And it didn't play out well. Mm. So there wasn't much upside other than survival. And mm. some of the people who live by that model actually didn't survive. 
So um, I'm going to let that go and find a better way of being me um, that doesn't take away from me being a man. It just means that um, I have a broader uh, lens of my identity, uh, my values, and how I show up in regards to my feelings. I think it takes a lot of courage uh, to share your, your feelings with people, to admit uh, that you are afraid at times to admit that you're sad, mm. um, to give people permission to come into that space of vulnerability, take some courage to let them in. Um, so their idea of courage required one thing, but a bigger idea of courage requires something else that allows people to draw closer to you when you need them. Mm. Dude, if you if physical strength is the only way that you mark strength, your view of strength is pretty limited, right? And that's the thing that for a lot of us, due to the definition, historically speaking of manhood, it was rooted in your physicality, right? How physically strong are you? How physically tough you are? But you were mentioning something about listening to individuals. And that was something that kind of struck a chord with me because it goes back to this whole concept of relationship and who do you respect? right? Who do you value? So it may be a family member that you really love and respect. And because you love and respect them, you take what they say is law because you love and respect them and you feel they love and respect you. And what they're giving to you based off of y'all's relationship is you feel something that they wouldn't give you something that would harm you, even though it may harm you. And, and, you, don't, it's right. and you don't have that information as a child. There so, you go. Young person. Ooh. And so the only thing you assume that they are right, right? Yes. I think that as adults, learning from my books, like from books like I Wish My Dad and about ourselves and looking at life through the lens of other people and their stories to gain, gain wisdom and insight gives us the opportunity to pivot. Yes. Uh, not with our children, but just in our own lives that, mm -hmm. so that we can grow and be healthier. Like you said earlier, you know, there's a lot of conversation now about mental health and, you know, people talking about, you know, good energy and good vibes uh, that flows from a good person. Right. Mm, so yep. you know, it's the work of becoming a better you, not just saying positive things, but being a positive person, living a positive life um, with, uh, you know, the intention of just having an impact on the people around you and, you know, leaving behind a good story. Mm. brother I'm, I'm gonna tell you as you were again every time you say something I'm like oh i'm going down these rabbit holes because it's such it is such fruitful conversation for individuals to listen into and gain some gems from you know there's a, a there was a, a concept that i've been kind of toying with recently and it's this it's you can open source your information but you need to closely guard your counsel OK, so you can get information from anywhere, but your counsel, we need to closely guard. And as you were talking, closely guarding your counsel might mean that even people who are closest to you might not need to be your counsel through various circumstances. And that goes back to the fruit of the decisions and the things that have happened and taken place in their own life. And, and it's kind of like connecting the dots, like you mentioned, you know, when it comes to relationships, it's simple. Hey, look, spend time with people, right? Ask questions, build a relationship. But when it comes to infrastructure, at times, you know, we have to have the questions and go through the different metrics to understand impact. We have to incorporate and fuse these two concepts as it pertains to the counsel that we receive from the individuals that are in our lives build relationships but we also need to kind of check the fruit to make sure and like you mentioned as a kid we don't get that but as an adult when we you know hindsight's 2020 we go back through it and now if we can help to plant those seeds in kids as they come forward to do it's okay to ask quite even though you love and respect this person check the fruit okay yeah. you know yeah. it's okay to ask questions mm. So okay but see, if we questions. tell our kids, don't ask me questions, you know, don't, don't question me. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. we're actually telling them it's not okay to ask questions. Mm. Mm. Brother, man, look, we can, you and I, well, we're going to keep our conversation going, you know, after this, but dude, where can folks grab a copy of, I wish my dad, where can they follow Ramal tune social media, man, give us all yeah, the tags sure. and everything we can um, do. 
Well, I wish my dad is available on all major book selling platforms. Shout out to my publisher, Broadleaf Publishing. So mm -hmm. you can, uh, you know, anywhere you buy books, Amazon, Books a Million, you know, number of different, wherever you get your books, you can get it okay. online, you can get it in a bookstore. Uh, if the bookstore doesn't have it, you can request it and I'm sure they'll get it in for you. Um, yeah, my social media is my name, Ramal Toon. That's R-O-M-A-L. Last name is T-U-N-E. So you can find me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, if you're over 40. Um, and <laughs> I started uh, a TikTok. So, uh, you know, learning to, learning how to put out these TikTok videos. I'm on Twitter under my name too, Ramal Toon. Okay, awesome. So Ramal Toon everywhere on social media. Grab a copy of I Wish My Dad. Anywhere you buy your books, yeah. physically in person or online grab a copy and um and literally man support this brother man his as you can tell he's loaded with gems so i would follow him on social as well so that you can kind of get some of these gems you know embedded in what you got going on on a regular basis as well yeah i forgot to mention that we have an ig and a youtube channel for the book um on ig is at i wish my dad and on youtube if you put in my name uh, there's a whole series of videos from people on YouTube that we have also posted to the website, IWishMyDad.com, of people sharing their stories of the impact the book has had on them uh, and the value it is to readers. So check out those videos on the IG and on YouTube. No doubt, no doubt. So Ramal Tune on social media, I Wish My Dad on social media and everywhere. We'll have some of that in the show notes. Grab a copy. And if you've not already engaged with the brother, let him know you heard about his story on Black Fathers Now. Encourage him to continue dropping gems. And if you follow the brother, you'll see he got most stuff as well. Again, like I said, he's a global leadership. We didn't even talk about the leadership thing across the transcontinental leadership development. And we didn't talk about the real estate joint you got dropping in the next few years. It's going to change the freaking game. Um, we didn't talk about any of that, but for all of that, follow my brother on all the social media platforms and uh, engage with him. And uh, my man, I thank you. Man, Mike, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the conversation. Look forward to more conversations with you. Oh, man, look, we connected, my brother. So you, know, you keep up the good work. I'm proud of you, man. And um, ladies and fellas listening, as always, y'all follow Black Fathers Now. And we're actually going to have some changes to the platform in the very near future. So as of now, follow Black Fathers Now. But when things change, you'll still be in touch with me just to let you know some stuff's coming down the pipe. But as always, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace. Yo, fellas, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And always, always, always visit blackfathersnow.com as well as follow Black Fathers Now on virtually every social media platform you can think of. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Just follow us and, uh, and engage with us, man. Look forward to hearing from you. And uh, I guess until next time, I'll holler at you. Peace.